So I've titled this morning's message, Expectations and Evidence of God, with a specific focus on Abraham and Lot. So let's turn to Genesis, which sets the scene for the beginning of today's message. If you go to Genesis 11, verses 27 to 32... (coughs) Terah became the father of Abram, Nahor, and Haran, and Haran became the father of Lot. While his father Terah was still alive, Haran died in Ur of the Chaldeans in the land of his birth. Abram and Nahor both married. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife was Milcah. She was the daughter of Haran, the father of both Milcah and Now Sarah was barren. She had no children. Terah took his son Abram, his grandson Lot, son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law Sarai, the wife of the son, the wife of his son Abram. And together they set out from Ur of the Chaldeans to go to Canaan. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. So we have Abram's brother, Haran, actually dies and leaves behind his son, Lot. Abram has married Sarai, who can't conceive. Terah, who's Abram's father, decides to leave Ur of the Chaldean, which is actually Iraq, and head towards Canaan via Haran, which is Turkey. That journey alone, just to Turkey, is 1,100 kilometres, and it's there that Terah dies. It is at Haran that Abraham, well, not Abraham, Abram hears from God for the first time. And in chapter 12, 1 to 5, we see what the Lord says. And the Lord says to Abram, leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all people on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram left as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. He took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, and all the possessions they had accumulated and the people they had acquired in Haran, and they set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. So there is a blessing spoken over Abram. But it is based on him obeying, as it says in verse 1, leave your country. He had to leave his people. He had to leave his father's household. Abram obeys and went, and Lot goes with him, which is also an act of faith on Lot's behalf. Verses 6 to 9, we see that Abraham travelled through the land as far as the site of the great tree of Morah and Shechem. The Canaanites were then living in the land. But the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord, who had appeared to him. From there he went on towards the hills east of Bethel and pitched his tent, with Bethel on the west and I on the east. There he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. Then Abraham set out and continued towards Negev, which is towards the south. So Abram believes in faith that this land will be given towards his descendants, but it is already occupied by the Canaanites, so it's not an easy take. The Lord appears and speaks as a response. Abram builds an altar. This is part of giving thanks and marking what God has declared. Again, at Bethel, we see evidence of Abram walking with God. As he seeks the Lord, he builds another altar before heading south. In verses 10 to 20, we see where Abraham starts to rely on his own thoughts. Now, there was a famine in the land, and Abram went down to Egypt to live there for a while because the famine was severe. As he was about to enter Egypt, he said to his wife, Sarah, I know what a beautiful woman you are. When the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife. Then they will kill me and let you live. 
Say you are my sister, so that I may be treated well for your sake, and my life will be spared because of you. Then Abraham came to Egypt. The Egyptians saw that she was very beautiful, and when Pharaoh's officials saw her, they praised her to Pharaoh, and she was taken into his palace. He treated Abram well for her sake, and Abraham acquired sheep, cattle, male and female donkeys, manservants and maidservants and camels. But the Lord inflicted serious diseases on Pharaoh and his household because of Abram's wife Sarai. So Pharaoh summoned Abram, What have you done to me? He said, Why didn't you tell me she was your wife? Why did you say she is my sister? So that I took her to be my wife. Now then, here is your wife, take her and go. Then Pharaoh gave the order to Abraham, to his men, and they sent him on his way with his wife and everything he had. This is the first time we actually see Abram relying on his own human reasoning instead of relying on God's protection. As a result, they were required to leave. Do we sometimes take things to God when decisions come our way? Or do we lean on our own understanding? As Proverbs says in chapter 3, 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. As we look further in chapter 13, we see that they move further north back up to Bethel. God is best blessed both Lot and Abraham so much that they need to separate because the land cannot support both of them. Abraham gives Lot the first choice of land. Lot chose the well-watered lands around Sodom. But it is also declared that the people of Sodom were wicked and were sinning greatly against the Lord. Abraham remains in Canaan and once Lot departs, the Lord makes a promise to him regarding the land. In chapter 13, verses 14 to 18. The Lord said to Abram, after Lot had parted from him, lift up your eyes from here, I'm sorry, from where you are, and look north and south, east and west. All the land that you see I will give you and your offspring forever. I will make your offspring like the dust of the earth. So if anyone could count the dust then your offspring could be counted. Go walk through the length and breadth of the land, for I am giving it to you. So Abraham moved his tents and went to live near the great trees of Mamre at Hebron, where he built an altar to the Lord. (coughs) Again, we see Abraham's response. He again worshipped God and builds an altar. The challenge to us is how quick are we to thank God when he either talks to us or gives us his blessings. Further in chapter 14, we read that there's a war in the region where the king of Sodom is captured along with all the people, including Lot and his family. One who escapes report this to Abraham, the Hebrew. And that's where we first... uh, I've heard the joke that that's the first time we actually here of coffee in the Bible because uh, Abraham is referred to as Hebrews. <laughs> Sorry, bad, bad joke. Abraham's response is compassion to rescue his nephew and he defeats the enemy and Lot is freed. As a result, the king of Sodom offers Abram a reward of all the possessions from the battle. But Abram refuses the king's offer as he doesn't want to be indebted to the king in order to fulfill God's plan that he become a great nation, and he knew what Sodom was like. In chapter 15, the word of the Lord comes in a vision speaking over Abram, and Abram questions the previous blessings as he is still childless and questions whether his slave Damascus will be the fulfilment of the promise. In chapter 15, verses 5 and 6, We see the Lord took him outside and said, Look up to the heavens and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. Then he said to them, So shall your offspring be. Abram believed the Lord and he credited it to him as righteousness. 
Abram's trust in God becomes the basis upon which God views him as righteous. The concept of righteousness based on faith becomes an important biblical principle as it is to how we are also brought into a right relationship with God. Abram had faith in God. We have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and his resurrection and accepting his free gift and then living for him daily. James refers to Abram's faith as it is also expressed in its works. If we turn to James chapter 2, verses 18 to 24. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds and I will show you my faith by what I do. You believe that there is a God. Good. Even the demons believe that and they shudder. You foolish man, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our ancestor Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. And he was called God's friend. You see that a person is justified by what he does and not by faith alone. We further read the story and we see Sarai, unfortunately, adopt a custom that was at that time for that region. And she gives Abraham her servant Hagar so that Abraham can have children, as she has not produced any. Hagar's status then changes from servant to wife, although she is still a secondary position within the household in relation to Sarai. Abraham's action taking a second wife was not something God required to fulfill his promise. Abraham's, sorry, Abraham's action leads to a problematic outcome. A rift develops between Sarai and Haggai when Haggai becomes pregnant. Eventually, Ishmael is born to Haggai, and this is when Abram is 86 years of age. Go, Abram. The attempt to fulfill God's plan by human effort ultimately fails. As we turn to chapter 17 and 1 to 9, when Abraham was 99, this is 13 years later, the Lord appeared to him. I am the Lord Almighty, Al Shaddai. Walk before me and be blameless. I will confirm my covenant between me and you and will greatly increase your numbers. Abraham fell face down. And God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You shall no longer, sorry, you will be the father of many nations. You no longer will be called Abram. Your name will be Abraham. For I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you fruitful. I will make nations of you. The kings will come from you. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your generations and descendants. The whole land of Canaan, where you are now an alien, I will give as an everlasting possession to you and your descendants after you, and I will be their God. Then God said to Abram, As for you, you must keep my covenant, you and your descendants after you, for the generations to come. So as I said, Abram's now 99 God reveals himself as El Shaddai, or God Almighty. Can you imagine the Lord just, boom, being right there and him in his presence? God makes a covenant and a promise, but is based on a requirement. You must walk before me faithful and blameless. You must also keep my covenant. The outward sign of that covenant was circumcision. Abram now becomes Abraham and Sarai becomes Sarai. I didn't keep reading all of that, but that's what happens. God promises a son 
to be called Isaac to Sarah and Abraham. And both Sarah and Abraham's response is, he laughs. The overall result, however, is Abraham follows God's command and the covenant is commenced through circumcising all the males. Let's turn to chapter 18, verse 1 to 3. The Lord appeared to Abraham near the great trees of Mamre while he was still sitting at the entrance of his tent in the heat of the day. Abraham looked up and saw three men standing nearby. When he saw them, he hurried from the entrance of his tent to meet them and he bowed to the ground. He said, if I have found favour in your eyes, my Lord, do not pass your servant by. Wow. Can you imagine the Lord actually comes to your house? Can you imagine this week you're sitting inside and you hear a knock at the door and, hey, there is the Lord standing at your front door with some good news. Abraham invites the three in and they eat together. And there is a promise that this time next year, Sarah will have a son. Sarah laughs at the Lord's promise. And God's response is, is there anything too hard for the Lord? It is here further that the Lord reveals in verse 20. And the Lord said, the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is so great and their sin is so grievous. The compassion of Abraham is further seen here for Lot and any righteous that are displayed. Abraham cautiously presents scenarios to the Lord, reducing each time the acceptable number of righteous in that city for it not to be destroyed. Eventually, Abraham stops at 10. God had further established the principle that the righteous would not be punished along with the wicked. Over in chapter 19, it is now that we can draw some comparisons between the visit to Abram and the visit to Lot. The Lord does not even attend to see Lot, but he sends the other angels who meet Lot at the gate, which is actually deemed a high position, which was given to him by the king of Sodom. These angels don't even wish to go to Lot's house but instead they want to go to the town square. Lost, Lot insistently encourages them to stay at his house, which they agree. There is a meal, but this time there is no laughter and there is no banter. After hearing the demands of the town people, the angel's request for Lot is for him to gather him and his family together. Lot approaches his two sons-in-law to be who are betrothed to his two daughters but not yet married. He goes to inform them that the Lord is going to destroy the city and to come with him. Their response is they laugh at him and they consider him to be joking. For me, I look at this and say, where is Lot's record? Where is his track record? Has he lived in this town of any sort of example? How is it that his sons-in-law doubt what he is saying? How about you or I? Are we living an example for Jesus in our witness? Or would people think we were joking or surprised if we shared our faith? Where is our example day to day? Bizarrely, even Lot has to be assisted to leave and is taken by the hand of the angel to help him leave. Ultimately, Lot, his wife and his two daughters escape, only for Lot's wife to perish. Because of an act of disobedience, she looks back. This may seem harsh, however, her actions suggest she identified with the people of Sodom when she looked back. Her failure to flee from God's punishment is a visible and vivid warning to us. What about us? If we are following Jesus, do we look longingly back at our past or have we truly fled from the things we did? Lot originally escapes to a place called Zor before he escapes in fear further 
and lives in a cave with his two daughters in the mountain. As a result, there are no men around and her daughters make a decision to further the generations by getting their father drunk and sleeping with him. From that, it gave them a man called Moab, thus we get the Moabites, and also another man called ben Ami, which we get the Ammonites, clearly casting these as both nations in a negative light. In contrast, we read in further the life of Abraham, at age 100 has a son and he is called Isaac. Soon after, we don't know how many years, but we know it's roughly less than 20, we see God test Abraham. In chapter 22, verses 1 and 2, sometime later God tested Abraham and he said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains I will tell you about. Your only son whom you love. Abraham had other sons, but God considered Isaac as the only son. The only son phrase shows the significance of Abraham's relationship with Isaac and also God's importance of Isaac in fulfilling his will. Wow, what would your response be? What if God asked you to give up something or someone you love for him? It could be your career, it could be a sport, it could be a hobby or just something you do so maybe you could make more time for him. However, this wasn't just giving Isaac away. It would be, in effect, ending his life. And what of the promise to make great nations from Abram's offspring? Can you imagine, was there even a conversation with Sarah? So Abraham's response in verse 3. Early the next morning... Abraham got up and saddled the donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. If we look on a map, Basically, we can see that it's roughly 72 kilometres that they've travelled. The thing that I find interesting here is, again, Abraham's straight obedience. Obviously, this must have been a common occurrence to worship and to sacrifice to God. The servants and Isaac do not question the motives at all to worship God. Again, this is a sign of the diligence and significance of God in Abraham's life. Verse 5, we read, He said to his servant, Stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Notice his words, We will return or we will come back to you. His belief appears to be that God will somehow restore Isaac to life. Verses 6 to 8. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac. And he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father Abraham, Father, yes my son, Abraham replied. The fire and wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. At this point, Abraham has not revealed to Isaac what is happening. And if he did, what would be the response from Isaac? We read further from 9 through to 18. When they had reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar and there arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on the top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. 
But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up there and in the thicket he saw a ram caught in its horns. He went over, took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the place the Lord will provide. And to this day it is on the mountain of the Lord it will be provided. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time and said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this and you have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possessions of cities of their enemies and through your offspring all nations on the earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. The ram becomes a substitute for Abraham's beloved son. Similarly, Jesus becomes a sacrificial substitution for us. All nations on earth will be blessed through the family line which ultimately led to Jesus. Note the final conclusion. Your blessing is because you have obeyed me. Again, more evidence of Abraham's faith and his walking with God. In closing, how are we living our lives? Is it evidence to those around me that I am a follower of Jesus? Is this demonstrated in how I spend my time, the places I go and the things I do and say? Am I a hearer of what is written in this word of God? Or am I someone that does what it says? Will my and your life be compared to Lot, who had blessings from God, and yet he made poor decisions, and there was minimal evidence of him ever trusting God, either in his family or to outsiders, or ever giving thanks to God, or making an altar and giving praise to God? Or will we be compared to Abraham, who was considered righteous as evidence of his faith, in God as displayed to his example to others and in his family life of following God's command and his ways. I don't know your life and the, experiencing your, the experiences you're facing today, but today is a new day. This year is a new year. You and I have a choice this day and this year through our lives or when you and I pass from this life, are people going to remember us as individuals or are they going to see our lives having pointed to Jesus because of our daily living and our daily choices?